morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad that everybody was able to uh, come to. The I know it's been very challenging for the for everybody having our children um, in our home during the day is not typical. Uh, typically, they're in, they're away in a school setting and not in the home setting with us. So uh, I can understand uh, what you're what you're going through. What I really want to say at the very top of this is: remember, you want to create the structure that your child is used to in a school setting. So how do we do that in a home setting? Saki, can you help me progress the uh, PowerPoint? Now it's not progressing, sorry. It was, there we go. All right, so how do we do that? How do we, how do we make a structured environment out of a day that starts at seven? in the morning and doesn't end to that behavior is communication our children are communicating with us through their behavior everybody commun communicates through behavior we all do adults and children are all communicating something through the behavior that we do day in and day out in every moment of every day even if we're not aware of it so let's start by how do we create a very structured environment that looks like the the school environment or the classroom environment that our child is typically uh, used to or accustomed to one we want to have a very very structured day and how we create a structured day we create an agenda just like when your child walks into a special day class or a special ed classroom typically on the board or at the front of the classroom is going to be a whiteboard or a blackboard or some kind of board that has the information for what's happening during the day, just for that day. So the agenda for the day. It's very important for you to create that very same agenda. This will help you tremendously. This will give your, your home environment a structured environment that's similar or, or, or looks like a school setting. How many of you, I thought this was gonna be interactive, so uh, I, I wanted to see a show of hands of how many of you um, are, are using or have seen or, or are aware of what we call PECS, a picture exchange communication system. Okay, I see lots of hands going up because I can see it only in the little green bar. All right, lovely, I love that. Okay, so, oh, a lot of you. Oh my goodness, very, very good, okay, well. As you know, this is a form of communication, it means picture exchange communication system. For those of you that don't know what it is, that website across the top is resource. Download these little, what we call icons. Now the icons are the child shows us if they're not able to communicate or they're have called uh, 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 verbal language. Um, what they need and what they want. We also can create what we want to show them that we, what we need and we want. So it can work both ways. It's a very compatible system. It was developed for, um, uh, actually for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, and everyone uses it now. It's, it's actually on our communication devices on ProLoquo, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, because that's another way to get picture exchange communication system into your um, into your uh, into your daily regiment with your with your child, so that you can communicate. I have a pointer. I don't know if it's going to point for you, but we see on the upper left is quiet. So we see sit. We see hands down. We see eyes on me. Crisscross applesauce. We see wait a minute. Raise your hand. Listen, stop, line up, help, I need help, or work. So these are all, these are very, very, what we call, you know, useful PECS communication um, icons. Now, this is another way to get a picture exchange communication system uh, without having the icons that are on Velcro. These icons, if we go back, those are typically 
cut out and put on strips of elk and put on a board. And I'm gonna show you a Velcro board with PEX communication system on it in a minute. Prolo Quo, we can download and use on our iPads. So how many of you are using Prolo Quo uh, for a communication system for your, for your children? Okay, so a good number of you are. Okay, again, that website across the top under Prolo Quo 2 is it looks like this. This is an iPad. Uh, uh, the kids uh, um, uh, very easy, uh, easily uh, adapt to the, the iPads. We use them for our primary reinforcers, don't we? So they know how to use an iPad. So there you have, again, another way to get a picture exchange communication system. Why am I showing you all these? Because... I want you to build something that looks like this, a daily home agenda. If you're using X, then you would build this way. And if you don't use picture exchange communication icon, then you're actually going to write it like this. But let's go back a second. I wanna take you back. There's a couple of more communication systems I wanna talk about. Remember, behavior, is a communication. So each child is showing us something about their wants and their needs, their behavior, and the way that they communicate. The more that we give them the tools to communicate, the, the less behaviors we're going to have. And I say that again, the more tools we can give our children to communicate with us, the less behaviors we're going to have. This is a Big Mac. How many of you have used or seen a no, Okay, so they're not using Big Macs. Okay, so about 13 of you. I think there's about 85 of us in this uh, Zoom. All right, so that's a small percentage. So let me explain about a Big Mac. I love Big Macs. Um, they're called Big Macs because they look like a Big Mac hamburger. A little, you see the red one different for different Big Macs on it. This is a more sophisticated Big Mac. What do you do with a Big Mac? You can, you can record a saying. You can record anything you want uh, on the Big Mac. And then the child is communicating. This, this child is communicating with, a, with what we call a switch. So this little minion here is probably speaking. It's a speaker that's a minion. But you don't have to hook it up to a little... Um, one of those little men, you know, you don't have to hook it up to anything. It has a little uh, a voice activated speaker on it. What do you do with a Big Mac? This is for very, very limited communicators. Do you want to have lunch now? They hit it. Yes. You, 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 yes. Um, you can teach yes and no. If you're fundamentally beginning communication process with your child, you can teach them what yes and no means, which is really the beginning of communication. Uh, yes, no, because they don't, many of our kids who are non-communicators or non-verbal don't know how to let us know yes and no. You can do it with a Big Mac. And if you want more information on that, you can email me that and I can show you how to get into the, you know, bring that into your home setting, maybe even have the child take it to school and have their aides and their teachers be using that. It, the, that's an Amazon website, but AbleNet, AbleNet is the company that makes all of our communication devices, hundreds of communication devices. All right, so let's move forward. Why is she talking so much about all these devices? Here's another one I want to talk about. Language man. Have you have seen this or used this? Raise your hand. Nobody. No? Okay. I don't know if your hands are still raised from the last question or not. Um, language master. Been around for about 30 years. A wonderful tool to teach language. What you see here is here's two different kinds. I like this one on the right. That's the one I use, the Cali phone. There's the website. 
for it. You can order it. You can buy them now for $30, the US dollars, very much. What do we do? Cards that have a strip here, a magnetic strip on the bottom, you see the, um, the picture of that strip, uh, uh, the card with a, with a magnetic strip on it. You take that. It all has a visual image. Remember, a wonderful communication device. Why is she showing us all these? Because remember, the more the child can communicate with you, the less behaviors you're going to have. All right, so we talked about that. Let's get to this one. This one is one that ma majority of you are going to be able to use, a daily home agenda. So what do you wanna do? You wanna create a very structured, predictable environment, just like the child is used to in a, in a school setting, in your home. Which means, morning, this is a whiteboard and a, a black marker. Um, you can use, sit down with, for the day. What is the day going to look like? Not for the week, not for the month, just for the day, that day specifically. So here we see an agenda, if you look on the left, this would be in a classroom, but you want to create that very same environment at home. And I'm going to give you some links so you can do it to some websites that are free platforms for language arts and math. So here we have reading. And what do we have also? The time. How long are we going to be doing it? I would suggest not writing in like eight, uh, 7.20 to 8.10. I would put how many minutes we're going to be. And so simple as get up. Language arts. Now, www.starf.com, how many of you beautiful free platform? Animated goes through kinder through fifth grade. Has language arts and math. Fantastic, fantastic program. So language arts, 15 minutes. Then we need a break. How long is the break going to be? 10 minutes. Here's another great platform, jacobslessons.com. Again, a free platform developed by a father of a child with autism. It's a straight ABA platform, straight ABA. And I know a lot of you are familiar with applied, applied behavior analysis. So you're gonna love it. It's, um, it's, it's fantastic. It has about probably 50 programs on it um, that you can do in different levels and, and all in trials and uh, uh, trials with a reinforcer, a verbal prompt reinforcer at the end. Fantastic. Jacobslessons.com, 15 minutes. Then what? A snack, 10 minutes. Then math on starfall.com, 15 minutes. Then free time, iPad or the Legos or computer. Give a longer free time during the day. You've got a lot of hours to fill. Um, 20 minutes is probably a, a good amount of time in unstructured activity for 20 minutes. Remember, all of these times are do, do going to depend on how long your child can actually sit and attend to that task. If your child can attend to a computer program task for 15 minutes, then just put five, just put five minutes. You're, you're gonna have to make that very, very person-centered. So depending on what your child, how long your child can do an on-task activity. So um, back to the math, starfall.com. Free time, iPad, use whatever your um, primary reinforcer is. You know, for, for the kids now, it's um, iPads and computers, but remember that the primary reinforcer really is food. So gummy bears, pieces of, um, maybe a little dish of ice cream. Um, you want to make sure that you're using primary reinforcers when you, when you give the free time. 
and, and add on a, a reinforcer with it. So uh, again, an iPad, a, Le a Lego um, puzzles, puzzles are building um, jigsaw puzzles. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the other day I was on a radio show and we were, they were asking about what are activities you know, our, our kids like to do. Just have a standing table in your living room or maybe in your kitchen area that has a jigsaw puzzle with the puzzle pieces on the side and begin to build it. Now remember, don't get one with a thousand pieces if your child can only do a jigsaw puzzle that has 10 pieces. Get, get the level of jigsaw puzzle that is applicable to your child but have it always there. What you wanna do is set up stations as well as the daily agenda. So you have an area where your child is going to know he's sitting down, he's attending to task and he's working. And that will be where his starfall.com is done and his Jacobs lessons is done or whatever program uh, you wanna work with him academically on. Then maybe there's another table that has all the art likes to watercolor or um, uh, paint with acrylics or clay, make an art table. Now make another table where the child goes to do free time so that you're moving the child around just like you would in a classroom, what we call stations here in the States. So you have a place where he sits to do his computer work. Oh, timer using your important to use your timer. This. I would not use the timer on my phone because the child can't see it. When it's flat, it's down, you can't see it. There's no communication with the timer that way. A lot, of, a lot I know that a lot of ABAs are using their phones for timers. I do not. I always use this or a diminishing timer. A diminishing timer is a timer you see a clock and use them in classrooms a lot because they don't have any sounds to them. And it'll have red, and then as it diminishes up in the time, 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 the red goes away. I like to use this timer, which is a regular old timer with five minute increments. It has a little bit of a sound, but you can put it a little further away from the child. And then it gives us a bell, an indicator, what, something's happening. There's a transition coming. We're going to be doing something else. A lot of our kids have, have a hard time transitioning. This is, this is an indicator that something is changing. So you want to use this daily agenda timer. So say we had that 15 minute language arts on stall.com at the top of the day. We have our timer and then timer rings up. Oh! Let's check our break. We have a break time for 10 minutes. Setting it to 10 minutes now. Take the child who need to do a physical, full physical prompt, move them to another area. If that break time is an art break time, then they're going to the art table. Set it for 10 minutes, put it down. What you want to do is try to get independent work going on. And you can do it if you get very, very structured and you use the timer and you use the daily agenda. Oh, the bell rang. Art is over. And what comes next? Jacobslessons.com. Go back to the area that is only used for computers and for academia so that the child is used to when I'm in this chair and this computer is in front of me, then I am working. Okay, very, very, very important. In this chair, in front of the clay, or the Play-Doh, or the jigsaw puzzle, or the Connect Four, or the games, shoots and ladders, or the checkerboard, in games, in free time. Okay, structure is going to be your very, very, structure and predictability. So math, and we went to free time, and then we went Line. Let them have a job. You can also have an agenda over here that says job agenda. You can have a whole nother whiteboard or make a whole nother piece of paper that has jobs on it. And I know that all of you say, oh, 
you know, I can't let him do that because he, he you know, I ask him to get the eggs out of the refrigerator, he drops, drops all the eggs, or ask him to get the milk out and the milk sp spills. Let him have or her have jobs. Begin to create jobs in your home for him or her. Not just clean up your room and I want this toy area cleaned up. A real job. Help me with the trash. Help me tie it and bag it and take it and put it out. Help me wash the dishes. And if that requires standing on it and maybe drying the dishes and putting them into the dish stand or washing them, not maybe not washing them. Drying is probably jobs to do. So fixing lunch, now your child's at home with you. Typically when they're in a school setting, they're going to lunch with their classmates, which was with that little lineup icon. We don't have anywhere to go. We're at our home. Oh, it's lunchtime. We're having 15 minutes for lunch. Set the timer. Can you help me make a sandwich? Have them, have they, even if you get out the bread and they put the cheese on top of it and put the sandwich together, then they've helped fix lunch. So to a lesser or greater degree, what they can do in order to give them that job to be part of the lunch, the lunch process. Then after lunch, what do we have? We have take a walk. So lunch, timer went off, off. Oh! And I would sit and I would make it a designated place where we're going to have lunch. If it's a dining table or a table where you typically eat your breakfast and your dinner meal, then have your lunch there with the child. And you sit with the child and other siblings sit there too. We're all having lunch. Oh, the timer rang. And we had 15 minutes for lunch. You can take more time for lunch if you like for fixing and, and, and having lunch. Now, what do we have? Let's go back to our agenda. We have take a walk. So we can do that, right? We're wearing our mask here in the States. We're taking the walk, maybe a 10 minute walk, just outside, just to get some fresh air, get some exercise, keep moving, keep moving around. Now, do I carry this with me when we take a walk? Yeah, it's okay. You can put it in your, in, in a little, uh, in your purse or in your pocket. It's a little big for your pocket, but you can carry it and oh, 10 minutes is up. You can take a longer walk. You can take a 30 minute walk. You can, you know, you, you are setting the, the time for the agenda. I'm giving you examples of how to put that agenda together so that you can fill a day. Then what we come back in the house and we'll, oh, hey, another free time activity. 10 minutes on the timer. Take another free, maybe you wanna do social games. Maybe you wanna set up a music center where you have headphones and a CD player, and you have some CDs, and the child is able to sit and listen to music, and sit and pick the CD he wants, put the CD he, he wants, put it in the CD player, use the headphones, and listen to music. For how long? 10 minutes. Timer's up. Let's go see what's next. We now are going to our next activity, help with dinner. And the same as for helping with lunch, give chores, help set the table, put the napkins, put the plates, put the silverware on. What's next? Computer or TV? Or if you watch, if you do something all together with your family in the evening, that could be family time. 30 minutes. Then get ready for bed. That's either a shower or we brush our teeth and we put our pajamas on. And maybe we read a story if they're a younger child. Okay, so there's a full day of agenda that you've written out and you've either written it out on a whiteboard like this, where it says agenda there. You don't need all the objectives and everything. Just the agenda with what you're doing and the minutes that you're doing it the number of minutes that you're actually going to be doing that activity. Again, if you're using, if we have limited, what we call limited um, 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 uh, reading ability, then we're gonna be using a, a agenda that looks more like this. And we have to change the icons, okay? And those, those are kept on that, 
on that uh, cloth with a Velcro, piece of Velcro on each part, you know, a male and female vel Velcro, okay? Again, let's go back and kind of recap. What are we doing? We're going to be using a picture exchange communication system with our very limited verbal communicators so that they can understand what our agenda is, what are we doing, what are we, what are we doing and how long are we doing it. We can use the pro lo quo and build an agenda as well. They have a schedule agenda on there as well on the prolo quo too, I know they do. Using a Big Mac to start, begin communication language with our children who are very limited communicators and we're just teaching yes and no and building a real communica communication rapport with them. We can get the one over there that has the four different ones on, we can program that, remember, anything we want, we can put anything we want and it's a, it's a little tape recorder. It's not very long, I believe it's 15 seconds long. So we, you know, that's long enough to put a long sentence. If you, I would like to go outside and take a walk. You can, you could put that in there. And the child is remember hitting it, hitting the Big Mac, hitting it. So it requires that one um, reflex. But if your child can't do that, then you, you would say, do you want to go for a walk and have it programmed? Yes take the hand, put it on the Big Mac, yes, hit it, and the child hears yes, and then you're going to go yes. So you're beginning to teach what yes and no is. The only reason I'm getting very, very simple like that is because I know that there's a lot of, um, a lot of you with young children, excuse me, with young children who have no language and don't understand the concept of language. And we have to teach the concept of language. And this is a really great tool, this Big Mac, to teach the beginning concepts of language, okay? Language master. Again, not very expensive, a really fantastic tool. It has a speaker. It had the, the cards were identifying images with audio and visual, um, and then a speaker. You can actually record your child speaking with that little red button there. So you can ask them, what is this? And they can say, you can record them saying ball. And then you put the card through and it says ball. I've, I've, I've used this for 25 years. One, it's one of my favorite uh, communication uh, devices. I have heard children who have never heard themselves and their voices change the way they communicate themselves speaking. It's, a, it's an incredible, incredible tool. Because most of our children have never heard their own their own their their own language, their own themselves speaking. This has the capacity to do that. Record them. You can just use the uh, the, the the card with the audio strip on it, uh, and you can and then you can use all of them together. Okay. These are the icons that we're starting to build a home agenda with. If we're with a limited communicator. This is a more advanced agenda where we're just going to use a little whiteboard that we buy with a marker, a black marker, and we're going to write what it is the agenda looks like each day. And the important piece here is I'm looking at that again and I go, oh my gosh, that looks like a really a lot of things to do. Oh, many things to do. So as we complete the task, we want to take the eraser or a paper towel or a napkin, and we want to erase it. That's what the beauty of having a, 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 a whiteboard is. Um, you can erase it. So get up, we did it, done. Have breakfast, brush teeth, we did it, done. Listen to our language arts on starfall.com, do our language arts 15 minutes, done. Why do we want to have completion? Because it's discreet. It teaches beginning and an end. And as the child looks at our daily agenda, they see, hmm, wow, it's like, I'm, I'm tired. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe I'm ready for a nap. Put a nap in there if your child takes a nap. They don't want to look at an agenda and see 15 things to do because all of a sudden we're going to get behaviors again. To, oh, wow, I got to do all that. No, 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 we're way down here. But how do we know that we're way down there? Because we erased everything as we went. And now we're at free time and nap time. 
Are you with me? So you want to create the agenda on a whiteboard if you can. If you're just using paper with a pencil or a pen, cross it out. Done. Finished. Completed. Completion is the most important piece because it's discrete. Again, a beginning and an end. We're teaching. We did it. It's done. It's over. We did it. It's done. It's over. Till we get to the very end and we see, oh, we just have, get ready for bed. Let's get ready for bed. We completed this whole agenda. Wow, I like the way you're thinking. And maybe the reward is, if it's a smaller child, would you like me to read a book with you for, for, for a reward? Yes. Okay, so build in a reward at the end of the day for completing all those things, because that's a lot of things. Okay. All right, so I can't get questions there unless I, well, let's keep moving forward and then we'll do the questions at the end, okay? I need to see, keep track of time. All right, so what, now that I've gone through that, let me get my watch. My watch. Okay, 8.30. So positive behavior support. What is positive behavior support? We're using our agenda, we're positively rewarding the child, we're building in lots of reinforcements, we're using our timer, but we wanna really start to begin to think in a way that is a constructive behavior program for our kids in a home setting. So how do we do that? We use PBS, Positive Behavior Support. And many of you that have done my workshops, you know this is, this is, this is, this is the, 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 the ground basis for me for behavior. And it is built into ABA. It is a, a built-in protocol for applied behavior analysis. So when our system is, belief system is that a person's behavior problems are unpredictable and random, meaning they're devoid of meaning and willful on a person's part, then it follows that the most we can do for that person is just follow them around, blame and react. So basically what we're doing with our children is reacting. What we want to do is set up protocol for what is expected when the behavior is given that we want. So the child knows that when he exhibits that behavior, when you ask, let's sit down in our seat and do starfall.com for 10 minutes, and he sits down, that he knows that he's going to be reinforced with, I love the way you're thinking, you sat down so nicely. Thank you so much. Now that's just a verbal reinforcement, but that's okay. Many of our, you know, our kids respond to that. If we need something a little more, maybe we're going to have a little bag of gummy bears and say, you know what? I love the way you sat down so nicely to do your stall, starfall.com. Here's two gummy bears. Okay. So we're positively rewarding the behavior that we are looking for and we want to see again. We're going to get more bees with honey when we positively reward than using negative reinforcement or punishment. Now, those are forms that we use in ABA. We use punishment one and two, and we use negative reinforcement. And here's two examples. Of, here's an example of, of positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement. If you go to work, you get a paycheck. You've heard me say it over and over and over again. If you go to work, you get a paycheck. So where's the reinforcement? The paycheck. So our children, we need to equate that to our children. If they go to work doing a task that we've asked them to do, then they need to earn something. And many times I'll hear parents say, no, I want him to do it just because I ask him to do it. Well, we don't, the world doesn't work that way. We work on reinforcement. The entire planet works on reinforcement. If you go to work, you get a paycheck. That's the basis of positive behavior support and positive reinforcement. Now, here's an example of negative reinforcement. You're driving along and there's a stop sign, but you roll through it. But you don't see the cop that's waiting on the other side or the policeman that's waiting on the other side to give you a ticket for not stopping all the way to a clear stop, stop sign. So that's a form of negative reinforcement because something happened bad after a behavior. 
If we go to work and we get a paycheck, something good happened after a bit. If we run a red light or a stop sign and we get a ticket, something bad happened. Another way that we see a lot of negative reinforcement being used with our children is in a, in a school setting is when you'll see names of children on the board and then stars, wow, uh, uh, Liam earned a star today. Oh, he earned three stars today. And James earned five stars today. And, um, and uh, Susan earned three stars. Oh, uh, James just threw the ruler across the, the, the room. It, I'm gonna have to erase all his stars. Uh-oh, negative reinforcement. Something bad happened after the behavior. Many, many times, negative reinforcement, what we get is a lot, a lot of behavior. So I'm not saying we don't use negative reinforcement because we do, and we use punishment one and two if we're using, if we're working with aggressive behaviors. We must, working with aggressive behaviors like scratching, uh, fighting, hitting, uh, uh, any, uh, uh, any kind of a, a physical aggression, we can't just rely on a positive behavior support. We can use what we call a DRO, a differentiated reinforcement of other behavior, a DRI, uh, or a DRA, differentiated behavior alternative of alternative behavior. But we want, we, with, with aggressive behavior, we have to use um, uh, a negative reinforcement because someone's going to get hurt. And we can't just go, oh, you know what? You don't get any gummy bears right now because you just scratched the little guy, the little boy next to you. Uh, uh, very hard uh, on his arm. No, 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 no. We, there has to be a consequence behavior. Something has to be taken away and something has to not good happen after that. But what we want to do is try to rely on a positive behavior support, support system again, where we are positively rewarding the behavior that we want. So how do we do that? We have to begin to look at them that are meaningful for the child, not for you, not for the teacher, for the child. Purposeless, purposeful for the child. Goal directed for the child. Communicative, like we've been talking about, for the child. Important for the person, predictable. We can usually predict behavior. We know what, what triggers our children. We know what target behavior is gonna happen after a trigger. So we have to become very proactive, preventative, behavioral, educational, ecological, and a person-centered support has to be put in place. So a behavior plan really has to be put in place. So I'm, what I'm saying is, you're at home with your child, you've created a structured environment, you've created an agenda for them, you're going by it, you're using your timer, you're letting the timer uh, let, signal the transition for the child, they know they're going to their activity. You're building in lots of reinforcements, making sure you're filling the day with, with something very meaningful for them and something classroom. But we also have to build a behavior plan for them at home. What is going to be acceptable? What are we going to accept? So what is their BI, behavior intervention plan? We're going to come to terms with what, what's going to be acceptable in the home setting. So what we want to do is ahead of time determine how you're going to deal with behaviors and how you're going to let that child know that this is what you're expecting from them. One, you're going to reward them when they give you the, the behavior that you're looking for, meaning if you give the verbal prompt, I'd like you to sit down in your chair now because our agenda says that we're going to do starfall.com for 10 minutes Show the timer, put the timer down on the desk. Remember, the same place uh, each academic, the same place each time for art, same place each time for music, same place each time for arts, uh, games and fun, and different centers in your home. Then we want to make, make sure we're rewarding that child for, oh, I love the way you sat down in the chair so nicely. Here's two gummy bears. Here's a, a, a piece of a cookie. Here's, um, um, what else? Any kind of a food, primary reinforced food, primary reinforcer food. So you want to carry around maybe a baggie with you, maybe tucked into your uh, into pant, um, so you can continually be giving reinforcers. 
oh, wow. I love the way you transitioned so nicely when you heard the timer ring and you saw that, oh, on the agenda, we were going to art. Here, here's some cookies for you. Here's, here's two cookies for you, two little cookies for you, okay? So we're setting up a behavior plan built into that very structured environment while we're at home with our child. And then we have to have contingencies. So they have to know if they do this, then they get that. Now, if the contingency should be built on positive, if we can, if you sit down when the t we, if you sit down when I when we look at the agenda and it in the seat we're doing math, then you get this. Sometimes we can build them on if then contingencies on negative reinforcement. We try to build it on a positive reinforcement. If you jump up, walk around the room, don't want to sit down in the chair, then this is going to happen. You have to figure out what that contingency is going to be. Again, with a reinforcer using a positive behavior support with if then contingency that is positive, you will begin to see a decrease in behaviors in those negative behaviors that you don't want, those antisocial behaviors, and increase in the behavior that you're looking for. That's the beauty of positive behavior support. We're building new behaviors and skills to replace the old problem behavior. We're smoothing the relationship between the person and the environment through teaching. We're teaching behavior we want. Hey, I like the way you sat down in that chair so nicely. Hey, I like the way that you got up when you heard the bell ring. You know that there's something else. We're going to be doing something different. Now let's go back over the agenda and see what it is. Oh. It's art. Let's go to the art table. Sit them down at the art table and put the timer on. 15 minutes or whatever designated. We are compassionately advocating for a person and facilitating self-determination. Remember, you don't want to have to sit with that child all day long. You have things to do. You have to be cooking and taking care of the house. You can't sit all the time. You want to begin to teach the child to be independent and self-determined. I even go as far as in the kitchen, on the refrigerator, in the refrigerator, I would make a little shelf that was low on the refrigerator that was just for the child, for his snacks. And maybe you put an apple there and an orange and a yogurt um, or whatever his snacks are. So that when on the agenda, it's snack time, you can say, oh, let's go to the refrigerator and pick out a snack. He picks out, he chooses, which one do you want? A yogurt or the apple? <clears throat> he chooses the yogurt, you help him or pull the, the, the lid back or open it. Where are the spoons? Pull out the drawer, he gets the spoon. And don't be feeding your children. Don't be feeding your children. Teach them how to use utensils. We want self-determination and independence. And we're relying on nonviolent crisis resolution strategies. Nonviolent uh, crises uh, resolutions. Okay? That's what positive behavior support really supports, is nonviolent uh, crisis resolution. So let's go over it again. <clears throat> when a person's behavior problems are viewed as unpredictable, meaningless, and without purpose or communicative intent, we become behavior managers. We are dispensing reactive negative consequences for random behavior problems to affect a hoped for, hope he's not going to do that today, but elusive and temporary suppression of behavior. It is not the way to deal with behavior. We don't want to run after behavior and deal with it. We want to be proactive. We want proactive supports and efforts in prevention, lifestyle enhancements, environmental accommodations, and skill building, all with a person-centered perspective. We're not only essential, but are the only strategies currently available to support a person with behavior problems that lead to durable, long-term behavior change, growth, and development. So that allows us to be educators and parents. Okay, educators and parents with our children allows us to live in an environment in our home that we can live with, that we're happy with, that the dynamics of the family are working. Because we all know that a child with autism can change the dynamic dynamics of a family. 
So again, being proactive, the positive behavior support in the if then contingencies, a lot of rewards. I love the way, I love the way you're thinking. I love the way you sat down, the way you transitioned so nicely. I love the way you picked out your own snack, all the verbal reinforcements and prompts, but also I love, let me give you two gummies. No, I'd like to give you a cookie because I love the way you're thinking. We've got the, what we call pair, the reinforcers with a verbal and a, and a tangible reinforcement. All right, now this leads up to what we really, really wanna do is determine what a function of the behavior is. So how do we do that? I don't know. I don't know why he does it. Does he do it for attention? Does he do it because he wants to escape it? It's too hard. He can't do it. Does he do it because he expects something afterwards and he uses it get something afterwards? Or does he do it because it's, it's sensory? It feels really good to him. You know, these things, a lot of flapping and, and the stemming um, feels really good to our kids. Those are, those are sensory seeking behaviors and they're okay and we don't want to eliminate them because they serve a pur purpose for our child children that rock you've heard me talk a lot about children that rock we know a lot of children who rock side to side hey there's a purpose they're regulating themselves we don't want to say you can't do that you can't rock be like telling telling me or you you can't sing because singing is sensory uh, seeking uh, behavior we love the way it sounds. So uh, for, for our children, these uh, sensory seeking behaviors have a function. They do have a function, but what we wanna do is place this and this and this with a more meaningful behavior that works for the child. It's gonna work for the child, not only in a home setting, but also it's gonna work for the child in a social setting as well. So how do we do all that? How do we determine the function of a behavior? Because I don't know, I'm just a parent. I don't know why he does it. Bother me? A lot of the time that in. No, he does it because he wants to bother me. No, that's not. Remember, it's not about you. It's about him. So first and foremost, in order to address a behavioral plan or a BIP, Behavior Intervention Plan for an Individualized Education Program, an IEP, you have IEPs, must know what the function of the behavior is for that specific individual in the specific setting that the behavior occurs. The most important part of all that is in the specific setting that the behavior occurs. Because we can use one behavior in one setting and use that very same behavior in another setting and it has two different functions, okay? Or maybe it has even three different functions. Or maybe it has four functions. Before we go to that, let me let me give an example of what I'm talking about. So let's say we have Liam, and Liam is Liam is in a a, a general ed setting, and and he has a peer that sits next to him in the classroom, and the teacher says, "Let's get out our math books and turn to page." D. Liam begins to lower and raise his head on the hard surface in front of him for 15 seconds. We call that many times bang. But that's not how we want to term that because it doesn't really tell us what that behavior is. When we look at a behavior, we first want to define that behavior. How does it operate? How does it operate? And we need to be able to be so clear that if it's written, that everyone can understand it. So if, if we say he bangs his head, that doesn't tell me anything about that behavior. This could be the way he bangs his head. This could be the way he bangs his head. This could be the way he bangs his head. There's many ways. This could be the way he bangs his head on a wall. So we want to be able to write out how the behavior operates, an operational definition of that behavior. And you can do this as a parent. You can just write down what that target behavior is and how it operates. So let's go back to Liam. He's sitting next to his, his friend in the classroom. Teacher says, let's get out our, our math book and turn to page 192. And Liam begins to lower and raise his head on the desk in front of him 10 to 12 inches for 15 seconds. Hmm. We took data 
and uses and used our data collection chart that we're going to look at in a minute. What do you think it might tell us about Liam and what the function of that behavior is? Let's say it shows that it's escape avoid. He wants to escape math. So he begins to lower and raise his head and bang his head on the desk in front of him. Escaping, uh, escaping or avoiding a task or an activity lets us know that the individual doesn't know how to do it. There's something in that task that that individual doesn't understand, doesn't comprehend, and isn't able to do. So what do we first and foremost need to do? We need to teach a replacement behavior for them. So in Liam's case, for that specific setting, for that behavior of lowering raising his head 12, uh, 10 to 12 inches, a hard surface in front of him for 15 seconds, that behavior written out, operationally defined, we, we take our data, at it and it, it shows us that it's escape avoid. He needs to, he wants to avoid that math by all cost. Well, why? Because he can't do it. Oh, it's division? Well, he doesn't know how to multiply. So if he doesn't know how to multiply, he certainly doesn't know how to divide. So we have to teach the skill of, a remedial skill of multiplication tables. So we would put a name with him, or we as a parent would say, hmm, the reason he can't math is because he can't, this division is because he can't multiply. Let's begin by how many minutes is before he begins to lower and raise his head after he got the directorial from the teacher. Let's get out our math books and turn to page 192. Well, he sat there for about three or four minutes, and then he started to lower raise his head 12 to 15 inches on the hard surface in front of him for 15 seconds. Then let's only ask him to sit with myself, my, myself being the parent or the teacher or the aide for five minutes. Five minutes. We're gonna start with, with multiplications of one times one is one, five minutes, the bell rings and he gets a, oh, do you wanna go outside and uh, uh, dribble basketball or do you wanna use a computer? He shows us on his PECS communication system. He wants to use a computer. All right, give him double what you had working on task. Let's let him work, eight, let's say eight to 10 minutes on the computer. Timer rings, he comes back, and we do keep going with our multiplication. Two times one is, two times two is, three times. We're teaching the remedial skill that he's missing, which is why he is trying to escape and avoid doing math. Same boy, his name is Liam. The math teacher turns to the blackboard or the whiteboard now, or smart board now, and begins to write 1,432 divided by three. Liam begins to lower and raise his head, but he turns himself towards his peer buddy who he shares the desk with. And he lowered and raises his head 10 to 12 inches for 15 seconds of the hard surface in front of him. We take our data, and what do we come up with? Attention seeking. It's attention seeking. He's saying to his friend, Randall, who sits next to him, I don't want to do math. I can't, st I can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing. I want to, I, I, I want to leave here. Attention seeking behavior. Remember, we're now determining the function of the behavior because the only way we can put a good behavior plan in place for behaviors that are not or are unwanted is in order to understand the function of the behavior, again, in the specific setting that the behavior occurs. In the specific setting that the behavior occurs. Now this same boy, Liam, his mother picks him up from school and they go to the grocery store and they're standing in line and you know they always put the chocolate right there at the front of the uh, cashier uh, in the line in front of the conveyor belt. Liam reaches for the chocolate, uh, the Hershey bar, and the mother says, mm, no, 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 it's too close to dinner. I'm not buying chocolate. You're not having that chocolate. <clears throat> Liam begins to lower and raise his head 10 to 12 inches on the conveyor belt in front of him at the grocery store. The mom looks around 
everybody's looking at her in the grocery store. Wow, what a really bad mom. No parenting skills. She grabs the Hershey bar. She thrusts it into Liam's hand and she says, take the Hershey bar. If we did our data collection on that behavior in that specific environment, what could it show us? Tangible. Hey, when I'm at the grocery store and I want to have some chocolate, when I'm ready to leave, I keep the chocolate right at the front of the, at the conveyor belt there, right where that cashier is. I just start banging my head on the conveyor belt and my mom gives me the chocolate. We're determining the function of the behavior. The behavior can be used for different functions in different environmental settings. So we must put a behavior plan together for each behavior in each set that it specifically occurs in. Now we go home. Liam's finished dinner. He's in his room. He's supposed to be doing his homework, but he's beginning to let his head go back on the wall behind him and go forward. Lowering, raising his head on the wall behind him, 10 to 12 inches, 15 seconds or more. We do our data collection. And what do we find? Hmm. Function of behavior, sensory. He likes the way he sees stars when he pushes his head back on the wall. Back and forth. So that is four different examples of how one behavior of lowering raising your head on a hard surface for 15 seconds or head banging can be used for four different functions. The first one was escape, avoid the math. The second one was he wanted his friend sits next to him to know, I don't want to do this math. I can't do it. I don't like it. I'm ready to get out of here and run out the door. Elope. Goes to the grocery store with his mom. His mom hands him the she bar when she can't take the pressure from everyone thinking she's a bad mother. Tangible. He gets home and he does his homework, but he loves to not do his homework, really, and bang his head on the wall behind him. Sensory. So one behavior, same behavior, operationally defined, it's, it looks like the very same behavior, or in his head on a hard surface, 10 to 12 inches for 15 seconds but it functions as something different in each one of the environments. So that means that each behavior plan has to be specific for the environment it occurs in. This is where we go wrong, everyone. We, use, we take one behavior and we use the same behavior plan for it in all ecological environmental settings. And then we say, well, that didn't work. Oh, ABA didn't work. It doesn't work. No, no, I tried it. It doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because we haven't gotten specific enough with the function of the behavior in the environment it occurs in. Because I'm here to tell you it will work like a charm if you determine the correct function for the behavior in the environment that it occurs in. So how do we do that? We take the data. It's all data driven, all data driven. Now, you, if you know who, everyone who knows me knows I'm a big data person. I take lots of data before I determine what the function of that behavior is for that child in that setting. <clears throat> this is an ABC observational chart. What is that? What does ABC stand for? Antecedent, behavior, consequence. And then there's a little area to write comments. So I've filled out one for you, for you to look at. Here we go. All the way to the left is the time. We want to make sure we are getting to look at increments of time. Why would we want to? We'll look at increments of time. Why do we care to, to write down time increments? Because when we use our scatter plot, we can begin to see a, see a, a, a system of times when behaviors occur. And that allows us to know what the antecedent was. If a behavior is occurring at 9 a.m. every morning, like it shows us on this scatter plot, we have to ask ourselves what's happening at 9 a.m. that could be a trigger for that behavior. So let's go back to the ABC observational chart. I just filled this in for you so you could see how you do it. So, and, and I believe that Saki's given everybody who's come a packet. It has, every packet has 
uh, one of the, one of the uh, data uh, collection packets that had all these, you can use that as your master and use these at home. Start taking that data. You're home with your child. Start taking that data just like they would in a school setting or how they would in an AB, ABA class or an ABA uh, session. Okay. So just, just we're going to read through it. So at 9 a.m., um, ask Liam to sit in chair. That was the antecedent. What happened right before the behavior? We ask Liam to sit down in the chair. Now we can think about this in terms of our agenda, our daily agenda. We ask Liam to sit down in the chair. What was the behavior? Liam screamed. He threw himself on the floor and he started tantruming. Oh my God. That was the behavior. What's the consequence? We picked Liam up and we sat him back down in the chair. The consequence has to be the truth and nothing but the truth, Your Honor. It doesn't mean what you hoped or wished you had done. It doesn't mean what you think needs to be written in there. It means it needs to be exact what happened after the behavior. And in this case, we're looking at escape avoid, probably escape avoid when we do our data collection. All right, at 9.10, Liam ran out of the room. He was sitting at the desk and all of a sudden, where did he go? He ran out the room. Oh, that's the antecedent. Now this is how I'm showing you that, that there are chains of behavior and what we call ABC observational chart is anecdotal, what we call anecdotal data collection. So Liam, up oh, nine ten. I looked around, I had that timer on. Oh my gosh, he ran out of the room. What did he do for the behavior? He threw himself on the floor in the bedroom. You're kidding. He's now in the bedroom. He threw himself on the floor in the bedroom. What's the consequence? I gave him an if-then contingency. If you get up and come into the room, then you can use your iPad for five minutes. All right? So I gave him an, a reward. I didn't use, sorry, let me get the timer. I didn't use a punishment or a negative reinforcement. I actually rewarded him for coming back and sitting down in the chair. And I gave him his iPad for five minutes and said, you know, I like the way you sat down in your chair. Here's your iPad for five minutes. When we're going to get back to work, implied. I wrote that in the comments. Okay, everything went along really well till 12 noon. I said, Liam, please clean up your room and put away all the toys. We're getting ready for lunch. That's the antecedent. Liam threw a toy at the door and then he started tantruming. What was the consequence? I picked up the toy and I placed it on the shelf. That's what happened. I picked up the toy and I placed it on the shelf. Comment, Liam did not complete the direct instruction. I'm just writing comments over on the side. 1 p.m., I said, eat your lunch. Liam and I had made the lunch together, eat your lunch. That's the antecedent before the behavior. Liam threw the sandwich on the floor. What's the consequence? I gave him a timeout in his room. I said, you know what, Liam, it's time for you to go to your room and probably have a couple of minutes in your room by yourself. You can do whatever you want in your room, but you need to go into your room and calm yourself down. I'm gonna give you 10 minutes of a timeout in your room. Timer rings, come on out Liam let's come back and either finish lunch I'm a big once once a child throws a food on the floor I'll fix it again it's done it's all over they need to learn that you know what if you're hungry again you have to wait till dinner okay 3 p.m. antecedent was play nicely with your sister with that iPad I noticed a little something going on here we're not playing nicely and behavior, Liam hits the sister with an open hand on her shoulder. Uh-oh, that's the behavior. Hmm, has to be a consequence for that. It has to be a cost response. It has to cost the child something. Can't just go around hitting people. Mm -mm. You know what, Liam? I think it's time for you another time out in your room. And we're gonna give you 10 more minutes, but I need you to go into your room and calm yourself down. Maybe you have nice music playing in the room. 10 minutes and then he comes back out. Oh, I did look at some other data collection and I see, hmm, hitting his sister with the open hand. 
He's been doing that. He did that at dinner the other day. He did that at breakfast the other day. He did that when we went to get in the car. I'm starting to take the data and I'm seeing that it's attention seeking behavior. So what is this telling us? This is just anecdotal data collection. We're not putting a behavior plan together with just an ABC chart, but we're writing down what the behavior looks like and what happened right before it and what happened right after it. Okay, I need to start moving forward till we can finish. The scatter plot gives us time and we can take data for a month, for one whole month. It has 31 numbers across the top. So I filled in one today for you, it says Liam, the behavior is tantruming. You do one of these for each one of the behaviors. Don't mix behaviors. Tantruming. April 2020. You're going to blacken it all the way in. If it happened two times or more in that time increment, you're going to just do it little, little marks that are, hers, uh, that are diagonal if it happened one time, and you leave it white if the behavior didn't occur. I just did it for today, which is the 7th through the 14th for you. But you, you could take uh, data all the way till the end of the month on this. And I showed, oh, he tantrumed uh, today on the 7th at 9 o'clock. He threw two tantrums between 9 and 9.30. I filled it all the way in. Oh, again at 12, he threw another tantrum. Huh. At 3, he threw another tantrum. Hmm. Oh, wow. At 9, he threw two tantrums when he was brushing his teeth and putting on his, then again, when he put on his pajamas. What is that showing me? What happens is you begin to see patterns, patterns of behavior. You can see that we see patterns where no tantruming is happening. So this is letting us know that, haha, something's going on at nine, something's going on at 12, something's going on at three, and something's going on at nine p.m. I can tell you what's going on. Those are all transition periods. My child doesn't transition very well. Liam is not transitioning well. I need to put a behavior plan together for transitioning. Okay. All right. So let's do this. We can save. All right. I do want to tell you about this, but I also want to take some question and Q&As. All right. This is in your packet. It's called a motivational assessment scale or a mass. We use it to determine, again, functional behavior. So what you're going to do is you go through the writing rater, that's yourself, the date, and writing that behavior description. Again, behavior description is the target behavior, operationally defined. Liam lowers and raises his head 10 to 12 inches on hard surface in front of him for 15 seconds. That's the operational definition or the behavior description. The setting that it occurs is lunch, dinner, grocery store, school setting, bedroom, bathroom, backyard, uh, on the sidewalk, setting where it occurs. And we're gonna ask ourselves these 16 questions. And we're gonna use a Likert scale. It's over to the right and we're gonna circle Never, almost never, seldom, half the time, usually, almost always, or always, to the answer to the question. For example, one, would the behavior occur continuously over and over if this person were left alone for long periods of time? For example, several hours. Let's say that it was Liam and it was in the math class, and it was the teacher saying, get out your math book and turn to page 192. And we saw Liam bang, lower and raising his head 15, uh, to, uh, 10 to 12 inches for 15 seconds. Would the behavior occur continuously over and over if this person were left alone for long periods of time? Well, probably not. So we're going to go never. Number two, does the behavior occur following a request to perform a difficult task? Ooh, yeah, he can't divide. So we're going to give him a six, circle six. You're going to go through each one of those questions, all 16, and then on the last page, it says question one across the top, one, two, three, four, all the way down to 16. You're going to put what number you circled. So remember for number one, we circled zero. 
for number two, we circled, um, I said six for that example. You're going to put the number that you circled on all 16 of those questions, then add them up coming down, okay? Coming down vertically, all right? And the, and the one with the largest number is going to give you the function of the behavior. In this case, which is just a random numbers that I put in, escape for another behavior, escape and attention, or equally the function of the behavior. 18, they both scored 18. So let's say that it's lowering and raising your head 10 to 12 inches for 15 seconds on the hard surface. He uses it, the function of the behavior, the majority of the time for either escaping an activity that he doesn't want to do or for attention. Attention and escape for best friends and functions of behavior, all right? So you actually have the motivational assessment scale in your packet, scatter plot in your packet, a clean one, and an ABC observational chart. So you can begin to take data, just like I've showed yourself on behaviors in your home setting, all right? So, if then contingencies. So, if then contingencies are best stated in the affirmative, affirmative in what we expect the student to do and what good things will happen when he follows through with what we ask him to do. So it's really the rule. So the rule is, so you want to say it like that, keeping with your student who hit the peer. Let's say, again, let's go back to the child who hit his sister with his open hand. You say, if you do not hit anyone from now until lunchtime, or now for the next hour, or now for the next 30 minutes, depending on how often that uh, behavior of hitting is happening, then you can have 15 minutes of free time on the computer after lunch. That's a way to spend in a positive, as opposed to if you hit your sister again, you're not going to have your iPad. Because if you, if you set it up that way, with a negative if-then contingency, you are bound to get a tantrum when you go to take that iPad away, right? So spin it the other way. If you don't hit your sister, then you get the iPad. I love the way you didn't hit anybody for the last hour. You know what? Here's your iPad. You have control over the iPad. If the iPad is the primary reinforcer for your child, don't be letting him have access to the primary reinforcer unless you give it to him. Don't be just using an iPad and handing it to him if that's your primary reinforcer. It's like if gummy bears are your primary reinforcer, you don't hand the child the whole bag of gummies and go, well, go at it. You go, oh, here's two gummies because I love the way you sat down so nicely when I asked you to sit down because we were doing starfall.com and math is the next, is the next thing on the agenda. I love the way you sat down. I like the way you're thinking. Here's two gummies. Okay? Spin it positive, everybody. Spin it positive. Okay. So, reinforcement is the key. It's easy. You just have to remember to say, I like the way you're thinking. You know, that's my very, very favorite phrase. I like the way you're thinking. I don't use good job. <clears throat> I use, I like the way you're thinking. Okay, let's finish up. I want to let you know about two courses that I wrote that are on um, training venue. One is an AMT level one certification online training. You can get that course for two, $299, uh, $100 off if you use the code IAC discount when you go into training venue. I also have a, a short course with Temple Grandin Temp, uh, transitioning to the workplace, a seat at the table. And it's also at training venue. And I also have another two hour uh, course uh, just on um, AMT, some positive behavior support, some of the things we've been talking about. And you can get two CEU units for psychology, social work, occupational OTs, marriage and family therapists, nutrition and dietetics, school psychology, and teachers. So you can get CEU units, and I, I think you use CEUs, I believe, in um, in India, correct? <clears throat> and there is the um, that's a called the PDR resource, PD resources. So those are the three courses that I've written and that are online for you. 
All right, this is my information. Um, website is autismmovementtherapy.org. I also, as you know, have autismworksnow.org and gloriouspies.org, which are my um, adult work program. And there's my email, joanne at autismmovementtherapy.org. So I think we're, we want to open it up for question Q&A. Is that right? Are you letting, yes. are you going to let me know? Okay, go ahead. We have a question. Take a, let me just take a sip. Hold on, sip of water. All righty, go ahead. Yeah. For all the attendees who are wondering why they're not able to see each other on camera, I have switched, we switched the camera uh, facilities off because of low bandwidth issues. But the next webinars that we have with Joanne, we're going to be able to see all of you guys. Um, the first question I know I missed the camera. Let me just say something. I missed the camera because I'm so used to, I, I you know, I, I teach online for 12 years and I love to be able to see everybody and everybody's, you know, out there and your smiling faces. I, I feel like I'm kind of talking to a void. I hope that it was good and informative for you and that you learned something. And if you, if you have any questions, I want you to know you can email me and, you know, I'm always available for you. Our next our next uh, lecture is um, next Monday, and it's on social skills, social skill building. So a good PowerPoint prepared for you on social skill building. Okay. Are there any, are there any questions, Asaki? There are four questions that I've streamlined for you, Joanne, because we don't have enough time to take all. So I'm going to request oh. participants to email Joanne all the other questions that you have. So the first question is Sudha's. She says that my child doesn't want to do any activity. She sits like do it, and she sits and she doesn't like to do anything and she's not much motivated with reinforcements either. What does she, what do you think she should do? What do I think? I think you need to start with an agenda tomorrow and I and you've got to determine what the function of the behavior is. There's always a reinforcer. There's always something your child will do. I would say right off the bat, probably most of the behavior attention seeking behavior, so she can spend time with you and just be with you. But what you really want to do is use the replacement behaviors, set up and teach. It's not going to be easy, but set up and teach replacement behaviors that are going to be structured in a structured environment. So again, get that whiteboard, get that marker, sit down, only, make, only put increments of five minutes. Five minutes. And then she has reinforcement. You just have to figure out what it is. Okay, next question. So the next question is Deepa's. She asked, what would be the concept for a child who's too small to understand negative reinforcement to an action? Say it again. What, what would, say it again. What I'm trying to figure consequence, yeah. what would be the consequence for the child who's too small to understand negative reinforcement? But he's ever too small to understand negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is negative reinforcement. A child learns negative reinforcement on their own. If they touch something that's hot, they pull their hand away, that's a negative reinforcement, isn't it? But he's ever too young to understand negative reinforcement. But again, we don't want to start with build negative reinforcement. We want to reward the child for the behavior that we're looking for so they know that that's what they're going to get when they give us that behavior. Next question. Next question is Ruba. She says, in a home setting program, especially for little ones, what do you want to suggest that they do more? that parents should make them do more of? I want them to build an agenda just like I showed you yeah. and, and follow it. Yeah. Nobody's too young to do that. No, yeah. And build in reinforcement and use a timer. Okay. Next. And what about the activities that you suggest, Joanne, for little ones? And more? For what? What little ones? What, yeah, what activities would you suggest for little ones who are at home? Okay, well, you just heard me go through all of that, and I gave you lots and lots of activities and things to do. I don't know how little you mean. If you mean, most of our kids are not diagnosed till they're 24 months, so that's two years of age. A three-year-old child can play with blocks, can use an iPad, can use starfall.com. They have pre-K and kinder on starfall.com. Can um, use uh, uh, Play-Doh, can, uh, build puzzles. There's lots of those, uh, lots of activities for three, four and five year olds. 
the last I would suggest those. But again, important, make a center in your house where we do only that. Make a center in your house where we only do art, where we only listen to music, where we only learn academics. Okay. Do what else? Another question? Just the last question. Do you suggest that the child, if the child can make the activity sheet, the child should design the sheet or should the parents design the sheet for the child? No, I, I, I like very much independence and self-determination. If, if your child can write, yeah, absolutely. Have them write what, you know, sit down with them and say, what are we going to do first? What are we going to do second? But yes, absolutely. I love the way you're thinking. Very good. Uh, independence and self-determination. Yes, let them write it if they can. And you know what? If they, if they, if they can't write it, you can always even do the little dots, how I show you how to do dots. And then and maybe the dot says brush teeth. You write with dots, a B with dots, a R with dot, U with dots, S with dots. And then the child takes the marker and fills in the B. Yes, okay, let's take advantage of every learning opportunity that we can. Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So just, just an intimation to all the participants. If you're looking for a certificate of attendance, then I've left the Google Form link on the chat. So you can fill that out and I can give you the attendance certificate for the webinar. For all, for Joanne's courses, I will have all the links put up on our Facebook page so that you can check it out from there and see if you want to enroll in the course as well as use the discount. Uh, use the discount, yeah. Tomorrow we have a webinar with uh, Dr. Roshandi Bagga who's teaching OT home strategies. So the details are again given up on, given on the Facebook page. I request you all to subscribe to our Facebook and YouTube pages for the updates. Um, and last but not the least, we have two more webinars coming up with Joanne. Uh, so again, stay tuned to our Facebook page for the updates on that. Thank you so much. We couldn't take all your questions, but I request you all to write to Joanne on the email that's given on her site. Thanks again, Joanne. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Be safe, be well. Thank you.